Have you been labeled with SIBO, taken expensive breath tests, and given extensive regimens only to feel that nothing in your SIBO strategy is working? Well, many feel that in order to address their gut symptoms, repetitive testing and chasing the next iteration of SIBO is the answer. Well, what if I told you that you may not be dealing with SIBO, but IMO, intestinal methanogen overgrowth, and that a simplified strategy may be more effective for you? Determining the dysfunction in your gut can feel complicated. Which test do you use? What do I treat it with and for how long? These are the questions that everyone is trying to answer, only most of the time looking in the wrong direction. Let's make sure that's not you. I'm Dr. Arland Hill, and I help first-time and recurrent SIBO sufferers restore their gut function by targeting all three phases of the condition to resolve their symptoms in a timely manner. But that also means that I have to know when it's not SIBO, but rather IMO, intestinal methanogen overgrowth. To start us off correctly, let's frame up this conversation accurately. If you are here, you likely have gut dysbiosis. And so that means that you have an imbalance within the community of bacteria and organisms that are living in your gastrointestinal tract. Now, what you may not know is that gut dysbiosis has multiple different forms. It can be labeled as SIBO, which you're probably familiar with, but it can also be labeled as CIFO or LIBO or IMO. There's all these different acronyms that indicate where the problem may exist at and what type of organism you may be dealing with. So small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, small intestinal fungal overgrowth, intestinal methanogen overgrowth, and large intestine bacterial overgrowth. But for our conversation today, the focus is going to be on IMO, intestinal methanogen overgrowth. And the location and the organism here are very unique, and we need to acknowledge that. You'll notice that in all of the acronyms that I gave you, with the exception of IMO, they specifically stated what part of the intestine they were in the large intestine or the small intestine. IMO just said intestinal, which means it could be both small and large. And we didn't state that it was a fungus or a bacteria, it was a methanogen. Well, what are methanogens? So hang on, we're gonna answer that. So the real question for today is, what is IMO or intestinal methanogen overgrowth? Well, quite simply, it is an overgrowth of intestinal archaea. And these archaea, are their own unique groups of organisms. Now, this has often been called or often been stated as methionine, methionine, uh, methane, excuse me, this has often been stated as methane SIBO. And that's not actually correct. And the reason that it's not correct is because we're not dealing with a bacteria. In fact, one author in one publication went on to state that the last name for methanogen overgrowth or methane SIBO is incorrect as bacteria are responsible for SIBO and prokaryotic organisms. Archaeans are responsible for IMO. Another individual in another article, pub professional publication, went on to say it is a separate clinical entity from SIBO. So it is very much different. But there is still the confusion that some studies still refer to the intestinal methanogen overgrowth as a methane positive SIBO but it is not a bacteria and it's not linked only to the small intestine. So we need to look at specifically what the location is and what the organism is. Now, here's the other point of differentiation is that there is a single dominant organism when we talk about IMO. And I'm going to use IMO pretty much from here on out in the rest of the video. Sometimes you'll see or hear this also referred to as EMO. I'm going to state it as IMO. So SIBO is usually a multiple grouping of organisms. So you'll see that whether it's Streptococcus or Klebsiella or uh, Pseudomonas or Estrichia species, there's usually multiple species that are associated with SIBO. But this is not the case with IMO. IMO is a single organism. It is predominantly uh, one organism that has been linked to it known as Methanobrevibacteria smithii, or Bacteria smithii. That's a mouthful. So 
don't worry about getting bogged down in that name. The point is that when it comes to SIBO, multiple organisms, when it comes to IMO, you're dealing with one predominant organism and it's an archaea. Now, SIBO organisms, again, I mentioned that they go by names like staph, strep. Uh, you'll also see some uh, Klebsiella, Proteus species in there. And those are the ones that you really don't want overgrowing in your small intestine. And that's different than IMO. There's also some physical differences in these organisms as well, simply because one's a bacteria and the other are archaea, two different um, phyla of organisms, two different classifications of organisms altogether. Now, the I mentioned earlier about the location, and this can affect the symptoms. So remember when it comes to intestinal methanogen overgrowth that this is not isolated to the small intestine, which means that it can also be present in the large intestine. It can actually be present in both, and this can also affect symptoms. So typically, whereas with SIBO, when you have the presence of symptoms that tend to present relatively fast, well, that's not always the case with IMO. Sometimes those symptoms may take a little bit longer to develop, even beyond two hours, and that's because we're dealing all the way at that point down into the large intestine. And so some have even stated that when it comes to intestinal methanogen overgrowth, it can be found in the small, the large intestine, and throughout the entire body. Now, in fairness, there is an overlap with SIBO. So about 30% of your patients with SIBO are going to have excess archaea. And when it comes to testing, that affects some of the testing results. So I'll speak to that momentarily. Now, we remember we need to understand what we're looking at. What are you what are you dealing with in terms of your gut symptoms that may suggest that you're dealing with more of a IMO situation versus a SIBO situation? And the answer to that is that typically when it comes to IMO, we're looking at bloating, abdominal pain, and slower bowel motility. So there's a higher prevalence for constipation. And it's not linked to any particular disease, at least not at this point, like SIBO is. SIBO has been linked to very, uh, actually quite a few different diseases at this point. Uh, for example, things like liver dysfunction, Parkinson's disease, uh, different autoimmune uh, diseases. There's a relatively long list, but that's not the case for IMO. And when you look at the two directly, the, again, there's different symptoms, there's different clinical conditions, and even in terms of how they affect the assimilation of nutrients in the body. SIBO is absolutely notorious for creating nutrient deficiencies, whereas when you look at IMO, IMO has been stated to not exhibit B12 deficiencies. We don't really know a lot at this point in regards to how it affects other nutrients, but we can say that it's not affecting B12 with any significant degree at this stage. So all of that as background leads you up to breath testing. And if you're watching this, you've probably done some breath testing. Maybe you're trying to figure this out. And here's what you're more likely to run into when it comes to IMO on a breath test. These are some indications that uh, of what you may be seeing, but also how to use the information. So first of all, understand that when it comes to breath testing and IMO, it is different than SIBO. You are looking at a lower cutoff. So for example, there is a lower threshold of how much methane is necessary to be produced to have a positive indication. Um, when we talk about SIBO, the amount of time that it takes when you ingest food, the amount of time that it takes food to go from your mouth to the junction between your small and large intestine, that transit time, what's known as your orosequal transit time, that in general is going to not affect the testing for individuals with IMO. Whereas when it comes to SIBO, if there's alterations in that transit time, it will very much affect the outcomes of what's on the test. But you don't have to worry about that when it comes to IMO. And part of the reason you don't worry about that is because methane, which is the 
primary product that is produced by these organisms is not prone to fluctuations like what you see with hydrogen and SIBO. So the reason that that's important is that it gives you more of a direct correlation to severity. It can begin to correlate whether or not the treatment that was utilized actually allowed for an improvement and what the treatment response is. And the other thing that's unique here is that the sensitivity and the specificity are much better for IMO testing than it is for SIBO testing. That's one of the little lesser talked about facts is that when it comes to breath testing for SIBO, it's okay but quite frankly, and it's very, very well acknowledged in the literature that there's a high possibility for a lot of false positives and false negatives. That same risk is not associated with IMO. So the breath testing is a, is a pretty solid way of assessment when it comes to IMO. And even from the standpoint of looking at how many times you have to test, even a single breath test, like a single point test, can be beneficial for IMO, and that's not the case for SIBO. SIBO, you need what's known as serial testing. You need multiple tests over a given time frame, two, three hours, and with, with IMO, you just need one test, so it's actually a lot easier. So that takes us through the background. It takes us through the diagnostics. Well, that leads us up to treatment. So you didn't get this far and listen to this much without trying to figure out what am I going to do with this? So remember, when it comes to IMO, IMO is not a bacteria, but we still use antibiotics. So let me speak from a conventional model first, and then I'll talk about the non-conventional model. When you look at the treatment of choice here, it's still antibiotics but they are going to lack in effectiveness. Now remember, antibiotics are specific for bacteria. They're lacking when it comes to archaea. So single antibiotics, like a single application of rifaximin or just neomycin or just metronidazole is not going to be as effective and it's going to have limited response against IMO. You really need multiple or combinations of these antibiotics and this has also actually been seen or uh, been stated in the literature as being true with uh, SIBO as well is that multiple antimicrobials are going to be more effective than a single antimicrobial but it is it is very well known that that is the case when it comes to IMO and these archaea but that's for antibiotics that's for the pharmaceutical model what about the non-pharmaceutical model where we're looking at different herbals and botanicals well same thing these herbals or botanicals however you prefer to say that these are also going to require multiple different botanicals to be effective multi multiple different antimicrobial botanicals so we don't want to just go in with just oil of oregano or just garlic or whatever the antimicrobial of choice is we need a broad spectrum of antimicrobials to be more effective and what about the empirical trial just let's start an antibiotic and let's see if it works. Well, that's not recommended when it comes to antibiotics. And the reason that it's not recommended is that one, there's a pretty significant cost factor to it. Two, you're increasing the risk for Clostridium difficile, also known as C. diff, and you're increasing the risk for drug resistance. None of these are going to be going to be favorable. If you're going to do an empirical trial, you're far better off doing an empirical trial against IMO with botanicals because the cost factor is drastically less. The risk for C. diff and the risk for drug resistance are not existent. So why it matters? That's really what all this comes down to. And keep in mind, the reason that this matters is because IMO is just starting to become acknowledged in the medical literature. So for a large part, it's unrecognized, which means that it's still largely undiagnosed. It's missed. It's just simply another way of saying that. And it can be linked to many gastrointestinal symptoms, many that you would associate with other conditions. And quite frankly, there is a simplicity to dealing with IMO. This is why it matters. We want to take a more simplistic strategy if we know we're dealing with IMO. We can apply a single test. 
we can interpret that test correctly and we can simplify our treatment strategy where we can implement multiple but uh, multiple antimicrobials that can deal with multiple states of dysbiosis. Remember, you can have all kinds of dysbiosis, but we can deal with all of those states of dysbiosis universally with the right combination of botanicals, and that also includes IMO. So, after watching this video and having an understanding of intestinal methanogen and overgrowth, here's another video to help you understand where probiotics fit into this conversation. The answer to this, it's going to surprise you.